today. Uh, we'll talk about bhakti, and we'll do that together. I want this to be as interactive as possible and need your help, because I don't have any answers. Um, this is a very, very fascinating and complex idea, movement, uh, genre of literature, type of religious uh, practice, whatever you want to call it, it's vast and uh, quite, um, in some senses, undefinable. Um, but we will, together, I hope, try to come up with some parameters, some ideas for discussion. So why don't we start, what, do you, what does bhakti mean to you? If I ask you today, give me a word to describe what bhakti is to you. Riddhi, what would you say? Faith or devotion? Everyone seems to like devotion. Devotion is quite a common one. Faith, anything else? Spirituality, all right, I'm gonna start writing these down because I want us to start to understand some of these ideas and see how they all fit into some kind of matrix. Faith, devotion, spirituality. Yes, sir. Okay, that's a little bit more than one word, but okay. So I like, I like the, what you said. I like everyday life. I like every day. I'm gonna write that down. I'll even write down divine also. What else? What are people thinking? This covers bhakti for you? Yes. Performance. Nice one. Okay. What else? Anything else come to mind? What? Mystics. 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 Very good. Okay. How about I write mystical? Or mystic, maybe is a better word. Anybody else? What? Prayer songs. Okay, so let me put those as two different things. Prayer and song. Good, I like it. Ankita, what's the first thing that comes into your mind when I say bhakti? It's there, okay. I didn't hear one word that I thought I might have heard. Yes, madam. There's the word. Love. And just like the English word love that can mean a hundred kinds of different loves, parental love, filial love, romantic love, erotic love, whatever. I think all of that applies here too. Anybody else? I like this. Say again. Okay, so let us say, let me sum that up with the word vernacular, at least for right now. Which again relates to the everyday kind ofness of it all, right? Good, excellent. Anybody else? Evolution. Evolution. Revolution. Very good. I like that too. I like evolution too, but revolution is, is good. Unbiased. Interesting. Okay. Selfless. Who said that? This is also nice. All right, anyone else? <laughs> I like it, boss. Huh? Inclusive. Okay. Let's stop here for a second. Looks pretty complex. One word means all of these things? Or evokes all of these things? Yes? I think you guys have all hit upon the major topics. So how do we talk about this? How do we understand this? How, what has been the traditional kind of understanding of how bhakti as a practice, let us say, has evolved? 
Or let me pose the question in another way. Because a lot of this lecture will be based on the poetry of these bhakti saints or bhakti writers. Where generally, maybe you've heard, or maybe not, do we think this kind of bhakti-oriented type of literature or sentimentality originated? Where do we find the earliest examples of this kind of writing, religiosity, devotion, whatever? Tamil literature is correct. So in a very general sense, and you can question this, but again, at a gross level, an argument is made by several people that fundamentally, the kind of religious, Puranic, what we might call mainstream Hindu ideas, God, Shiva, Parvati, the cosmos, that understanding, that great Sanskrit cosmos world that we've kind of been talking about in this class for many times, flows down from the north into the south, trickles down, comes in, and enters the stream of the already existent Tamil literary tradition, which you find the earliest examples in the Sangam literature. We're talking the early centuries of uh, the current, or no, the last millennium, so like 200 AD, let us say, something like that. That stuff, that cultural material, enters Tamil Nadu, mixes with what's going on in that realm, and all of this kind of Puranic kind of stuff, all the gods, all the goddesses, all the adventures, the stories, Mahabharata, Rama, and everything, gets incorporated in this world, and then these Tamil poets start writing these new kinds of poems. And I'll show you some examples of that. And then slowly, slowly, this stuff starts going back up north. And in the process, you have all sorts of other languages coming in and developments in the north. And it's this kind of circulation of these themes and ideas that really generates this idea of bhakti. That is, at a gross level, what many scholars have proposed, Ramanujan, my own teacher, Hart, George Hart, others, many other people. And for the most part, this has been the clearest understanding of it, at least historically. Because we don't have examples of that kind of bhakti until you know, 6th, 7th, 8th century in South India. Any questions up to this point? OK. So all of these things, let me look at one. For example, this one. Why did you say revolution? Right, so this everyday thing, what, we were saying that in, in the north during that period, people were not feeling God was accessible. Aha. So what do you mean by those intermediaries? Priests, temples, and this kind of thing. So some kind of now direct connection to the divine. Could we say that? Yes. And in that sense, you see it as revolutionary. Yes. Yeah. So that's, I think, a, a good underlying theme that we'll see in all of these poems, is that personal, direct experience. So people have tried to characterize bhakti in you know, all of these ways. So I'll give you one. This is a recent compilation of bhakti poetry, uh, Arundhati Subramanyo. And I'll, I'll write, I'll read, you know, there's a saying, you know, my guru used to always say, the saying in Sanskrit is, you should read the oldest text with the newest commentary. So this is like the oldest stuff, but this is the most recent book I could find on bhakti. So let's see what she has to say about this. So I'll give you a taste of the kind of writing and how she's describing it. And it'll kind of summarize some of these ideas. And we'll talk more about it in a second. So let me read to you the kind of things she's talking about. This is the breath-catching moment when self speaks to self 
more directly than you ever thought possible. So not only self to God, but self to self. A moment that sears through the smog of belief and doctrine, the endlessly recycled traffic of theology, the airwaves of opinion, a moment when you know you are witness to the self, pretending to, pretending to be none other than itself, a simple insatiable throb. This is a throb that will not be silenced. This is a throb that will not settle for bucket list petitions for easy deals for a brokering God. This is a throb that demands everything, all that ever was and ever will be, all that is here and now, and all that is before and beyond. It clamors for form and for no form, for thinginess and no thingness, even perhaps while knowing all along that there is not much difference between the two. This is a thought throb so definitive, so encompassing that it blurs the conventional divide between the sacred and the profane. It is a throb that demands union and annihilation, love and liberation, ecstasy and extinction, more and more and more, and it demands it now. Everyone has known it. Many choose to forget, defer, deny, or dilute it. Understandably, it is convenient. It makes life difficult. When one does, and does encounter it, however, one knows one is in the presence of something fragile, urgent, and moltenly alive. This is bhakti, and that's how she defines it. So what, what is the big thing you're getting out of this? These big lists of sacred, profane, historical, mythological, I mean, there's a dialectic here that's pro of the, the, the kind of human mind, how we understand the world. It is, to me, that dialectic that is being destroyed by bhakti. And for a long time, I mean, it was just the other day I had this thought. So like, if we put up something like, and we'll discuss this more in the other lecture that I'll give, um, classical folk, right? Let us just think about that for a second. In the Sanskrit tradition, in the theory, you know, this is generally called marga, and this is desi. Can you think of other things that get put on this kind of a binary understanding of Indian culture, thought? Some of them we can put into this from here, into that list. For example, you get the vernacular that goes on this side, let us say, and you, let us say you put Sanskrit on this side. Anything else that we can do? Let us say, maybe inclusive, exclusive, every day, right, the mundane versus the kind of cosmic, you know, those kinds, all of those things we can kind of map. And it's very traditionally thought of in this way, mapping it into these dialectical positions. And I've been thinking about it because people are always, you know, and even me, I mean, I, you're always talking about how these are interacting, right? And then it kind of hit me the other day that it, it's only me or us that create this kind of list, you know, like two threads, and they're kind of interacting. And really, for me, it's, it, 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 it's not like that anymore. In my mind, I'm trying to get rid of this, which is really, I'm saying, the heart of what Bhakti is trying to do. And really, the whole thing looks like, to me, like some kind of double helix now. That's what hit me the other day, that you can't take these things apart. It's too difficult to, maybe we can identify some elements of this is classical or that's more from a folk tradition or whatever, but it's fundamentally united in this way that almost is not possible to take apart. With me so far? Any questions? Oh, oh, can we say that the origin of Bhakti movement died in the concept of Nirgun Brahman? So that falls in here too. So let us say, I mean, I don't know if it falls into this dichotomy, but the nirguna saguna bifurcation is also part of the bhakti tradition itself. But then it gets incorporated into a god which is formless and uh, amorphous. But, but, but there are certain bhakti traditions, as we'll see, where the god is very present. The saguna form of bhakti is totally there, and we'll see lots of examples of that. Later, you get the nirguna stuff coming, coming about, like a kabir, which we'll see a little bit of. Now, all of this stuff 
Vedas, Upanishads, folk stuff, classical stuff, vernacular stuff, all of it gets mixed into this bhakti stuff. So I've been thinking out of all of these things, what really defines it for me? How do I know, like she said, when it's bhakti? Anyone have a suggestion to make on this note? It took me a long time, but it hit me the other day. And I'm, again, this is just a working hypothesis. I don't have any answers. I want to discuss with everyone and learn. And the thing that I have felt is the, the thing that really gets me, which we don't see so much prior to this movement, prior to this revolution, is the voice, a singular voice. One person, their individuality, their consciousness of the world being expressed with their name, with, or to put it in, in another way, for me, bhakti represents the rise of subjectivity in the Indian consciousness. Now that's a bold claim, but I'm willing to make it. It's personal. It's like very immediate. And it's really derived from the outpourings of individuals. So with that little bit of introduction, let us look at some of these poems. I kind of organized them to pick, I think there's 11 of them. I've organized them in a somewhat chronological fashion so we can see some of that circular movement of stuff. But before we go there, every good lecture should start with some kind of etymology. Anyone know what the dhatu, the root in Sanskrit of the word bhakti is? No, that's not a root. But it is related. Here we go. It's from the root budge. Now if you look at these words, it's like our list that we've created. It encompasses a lot of things and I think most of these things we can see in all of these poems at some point. To share, to distribute, to divide. This one is a very important one. Because as much as bhakti is about that individual voice, the form of devotion which it instilled in people was not individualistic, but rather community-based for a large part of it. Singing songs together, being together, partaking in that experience of the divine as a collective. Right, to share, to take, to accept, to receive, all of these things, to enjoy, possess. You will find poems, sometimes people talk about them like cannibalistic forms of bhakti, where you say you want to eat the god. In fact, that's what this whole thing is called, eating god. It, it's, it's that desire of complete union, to be one with that thing. It's a very powerful experience, which is why mystic is an excellent word here because it has that kind of transcendentary mystical component to it. Sometimes you're, you see people listening to bhajans, they're just, whoo, gone, gone. What is that? That's that fervor of that bhakti. What else? To adore, honor, worship. So we're back to a more kind of, you know, worshiper, worshipped kind of modality. So that's there. To choose, to enjoy carnally. There you go. To be attached, to avoid, to take possession of, to grant, bestow. Towards the end, we find to love, finally. So it's complex, is what I'm trying to get across. OK, so now I'll go through, run through some of these poems. Let us try, as a group, again, to collectively think about some of these ideas in reference to these poems. OK, so the first poem, one of the great Vaishnava Tamil poets. Everyone should read this book, Hymns for the Drowning. And this one is kind of the companion, actually this was the early one, speaking of Shiva, both written by A.K. Ramanujan. It's a, you know, a luminary in the field. And particularly when it came to literature, I mean, in many ways, Ramanujan was the one who showed the world that Indian poetry could be translated in a beautiful way into other languages. 
That was one of his contributions, a great translator. He also was able to contextualize things, bring new perspectives on, on many issues, including bhakti, in quite profound ways. So really, if you want to know the kind of heart of where I come from, at least academically, uh, even, even as a poet, it's a lot influenced by Ramanujan. And you'll see kind of his, many of his ideas here. He was also my, kind of in my parampara. My guru also studied with him for some time. So a wonderful scholar. So let me read some of these poems. Namalvar, one of the great Alvars. There's a whole group of Vaishnava Tamil saints. Namalvar is one of them, kind of the most popular. Namalvar, he's our Arvar. He's, he's our guy, right? So let me read this poem. This is written in Tamil. This is the ninth century. So at the bottom of these poems, I give you the language, the rough century, and the translator. I think translation, again, is a very important thing because bhakti happens in all sorts of different languages. And we need that kind of good translating of all this material to a language that we can kind of feel. You can't just translate these poems as you know a literal kind of thing. It doesn't really convey what it's supposed to. So let me read out these poems. See what you feel, what you sense, what you notice. O oh Lord unending, wearing honey flowers and basil leaf in your hair, tell us this. As moon, as sun, as the amazing numberless stars, as darkness and as torrents of rain, as honor, as shame, and as death with his cruel eyes, how fantastic can you get? Now what do you see here? Who is he talking to? Who is this Lord that he's talking to? Who has basil leaves? Tulsi. Some form of Vishnu, right? Very clearly he has that image in mind. But he brings in all these other things. Right? It's like all encompassing. It's like the whole world. He can't deal with it. But then, if you really start to look at what is the modality in which this is being expressed, you will remember we came across a lot of these prashastis. You can see that kind of praise type of mode happening here, right? So all of these threads, you can see various threads of Indian literary and otherwise um, cultures coming into these poems. So here you have Vishnu is there. Now, we can't talk about Sangam poetry today, but it would be fascinating, and people have done this, to look at the Sangam poems also to see how that kind of prasasti literature that you see in the older Tamil stuff flows out into this. Question? And again, this dialectic issue, right? These op oppositional forces that we think are on one side or the other. It is a collapse of that, which is really the bhakti experience. In one sense, you could say bhakti is a very advaitic experience. And we'll get back to that in a second. Andal. Anyone hear of Andal? Also comes from the Alvar tradition. She was a young girl. She was the daughter of another Alvar, Peri Alvar, Vishnu Chitta, also known as Vishnu Chitta. This was a young girl. Her father was a garland maker. He would make garlands for the temple in Sri Viliputur and he would give them to the Lord as his offering. So he used to ask Andal to take the garlands to the temple. And this girl, in her kind of young, pubescent, kind of whatever, fantasy land, she believed in her mind that she was married to Lord Ranganatha. And so when she used to take these garlands, she used to actually put on the garlands. Imagine that this was her bridal garland. Imagine herself a mar married to her long lost husband, the Lord. And then she'd go and take them to the temple. So one day, Peri Alvar saw this, saw a small hair in the garland. And he gets really upset. Of course, this is like a, a prasad that is being given. It should not be polluted by anybody, right? It should be pure. She says, what's going on? Why is this hair here? How did this happen? She says, oh, I put these on every day, you know, and, and just then I, oh, he got mad at Pissed off. And then later that day, 
this Swami, that Vishnu Murti that was in Viliputur, comes to him and says, boss, 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 I don't want any of those nice, clean garlands that you make. I only want those ones that Andal has given me. So in, even in this story, you see that kind of counter to the normative procedure. You see what I'm saying? What once was considered polluted, what once was now the thing that you didn't want, that you wanted to throw away, now in the, even in the God's own consciousness, becomes the thing that is most revered. So you have an inversion of all this stuff. So let me now read one of her poems. And she wrote beautiful poetry. And the kind of love you get here is it's like this adolescent love type of feeling, so a different kind of love. And you'll see various other kinds of love come up. With white designs, I decorate the streets of your procession. Before dawn washes the sky, I wash myself in the chill river. Small, smooth twigs I rouse to holy flame while calling you, Kamadeva, to descend and fulfill my prayer. Blossoms dripping nectar I string into garlands while chanting the name of the dark one who tore Bakasura's beak. I beseech you, inscribe my name on your flower arrow and shoot it into my Lord Narayana. So what's going on in this poem? Who is she talking to? Who is she addressing? Kamadeva. Kamadeva. Again, uh, you could say a northern import, right? And the mythology with Kama and his bow, his love bow, that's all there. Bakasura is mentioned again, right? Characters you know from that Puranic mythology. But what is she asking him to do? What is she asking Kamadeva to do? Read the poem again. <laughs> yes, that's exactly right. She's like, get this Kama to go and shoot Vishnu Murthy so she falls in love with me. Again, another inverse. The whole process, no one ever asks God to fall in love with them. You fall in love with God, that's fine. Here, she, she, she already knows. She's already there. She is the one that's waiting. For that. It's, and it's very intense stuff. And there's a young girl writing this stuff too. And powerful. And so you see how it's related again to this everyday lifeness? What, do, what are these white designs that she's talking about? Or this translator is talking about? Yeah. This is, you know, everyone doing puja, cleaning the house in front, you know, putting the rangoli or whatever you call. All of these day to day activities become linked to all of the process. OK, let's keep going. So this is also around 8th century. This is a new translation. Um, very nice book. You should check it out. I don't think I have it here. but Now, this is a beautiful poet writing in Kannada from this Speaking of Shiva book. This is a woman who left home, took off all her clothes, said, I don't need these clothes. I have no you know, issues with any kind of normative prescriptions of society that tell me to you know, wear this or do that or anything. I'm not interested in that. I'm out. Let's hear what she has to say. People, male and female, blush when a cloth covering their shame comes loose. When the Lord of lies lives drowned without a face in the world, how can you be modest? When all the world is the eye of the Lord, on looking everywhere, what can you cover and conceal? What is she trying to say? Anybody? Your thoughts on this? Omnipresent, omnipotent God. Say loud. God is omnipresent and omnipotent. 
Omnipresent, omnipotent, yes. But what's the next step that she's really getting at? Right, these sh this, this shame, th where does it come from? Who's, who's imposing these constraints of what is shameful or not? Yes. And she's saying, I'm going to do whatever I want because everything is known to the, to the God and he's the only one that really matters to me. I don't care what you people are saying. It is that personal thing, it is that, you know, Resistance, and that's why revolution is a good world, resistance of the normative trend. So by destroying that dialectic, there's an inversion of that dialectic, there's a confrontation with that dialectic, and then everything kind of smooths itself out, in, at least in her mind. Now, she was thought of a crazy person by many people. And maybe there was an, an element of craziness to these poets. But how many artists do you know that aren't a little bit crazy? There's something about that, an insight that comes through those kind of heightened states of awareness, let us say. So she comes from the, uh, not exactly, but somewhat related to the Veera Shaiva movement that was happening in Karnataka. This is a major point of a lot of bhakti poets. Um, and I'll show you one, another one, another good example of that. Let's see that. This is Basava, Basavanna, kind of the founder of this movement. This is quite a simple but beautiful poem. And I think it addresses many of these things. The rich will make temples for Shiva. What shall I, a poor man, do? My legs are pillars, the body the shrine, the head a coppola of gold. Listen, O Lord of the meeting rivers, things standing shall fall, but the moving shall ever stay. Now that's kind of profound. So like you said, that no need of that mediation. There's no middle ground here. I, he doesn't need a temple, right? I am my own temple. I don't need a priest to tell me. I can talk directly to God. He's a poor man. He's outside, maybe. He can't maybe get into those same places that everyone else wants to get to. There's a, a directness, a bodily quality that you feel in this. Again, the dialectic, things standing shall fall, but the moving shall ever stay. That contradiction. But what is actually a subtle reference here is, you know, the Virashaivas, Lingayats, you know, they move. And they keep the, this thing with them. And that's like God's always with them. They don't need to go anywhere because God is just with them all the time. So it's a, it's a reference to that Jangama culture of movement. That I can be moving anywhere, but I'm always with God, or God is always with me. Quite a profound thing. And these were new ideas. People didn't think about stuff like this before. Something was changing. So now we're into the 12th century. Things are now going to, are moving upward, right? So we were in Tamil Nadu, we moved to Karnataka. We're going to move north soon enough. Deccan, Marathi, Gyandev. Now this is quite also a beautiful poem. Because this is part of his commentary on the Gita. And so you see how even a very, you know, normative fixed text like the Bhagavad Gita is now given to people in the vernacular. That that high kind of philosophy, this great Vedanta, he wanted to make this accessible to everybody. So that everydayness, the vernacular is there, right? Inclusiveness is there. This was very, very important. People didn't have even, even exposure to this kind of thinking. Or these highfalutin concepts like Advaita, Atma, Karma, who cares? Make this accessible to those people. And particularly because of the language use. I mean, 
bhakti and the, in the evolution of it is intimately connected to the whole process of vernacularization that was happening in India from around 1000 CE. People being able to express themselves in a literary way through language that they felt comfortable and grew up in were the common language of common people, not the more distant language of a Sanskrit. See now how these kind of fairly, you know, complex philosophical ideas get put into a very beautiful kind of poetic voice. The quintessence of awareness, the knowledge of infinity, the one whom the sky clothes, who has no form, no color, no property, that graceful one, Hari, the reliever. I've seen him filling my eyes. Seeing him, I've set aside even the act of seeing. Says Gyandev, inside any flame is the self's very own flame. And that flame is imaged here, standing on the brick. I'm actually not 100% sure what the standing on the brick part is. I have to do a little more research on that. Perhaps, perhaps the idea that the vigraha, this, the object of which we you know, give adoration to, is not necessarily that thing, but essentially representing these more philosophical ideas. That's one idea I have. I don't know. I haven't done enough research on this. But do you see how some of these Vedantic ideas are coming into a different kind of language, space? Is that somewhat clear? Do you get that sense from this? Yes? No? No? Anybody? Yes, Vitala is his god. See, I'll, another thing. Who's, what, what, why? He's standing on, Vitala stands on a brick? Ah, then there it is. See, good. And you saw in the other one, Basavanna has the meeting by the rivers. All these different names of different gods are put in. And there's all, usually like a very specific deity that they're worshipping whatever their Ishta Devata, their Kula Devata, right? That focus is also something that you see through all of these poems. That one god is picked, but is representative of, of course, much bigger ideas. And the fact that it's still now, all, all of this stuff is in that Saguna modality, right? The leaves, the Kama Devas, all of this stuff the attributes of this great God. It's all still there. Question? Let's move on. Another very important... Yes? Puranas and the Bhakti poets. The Puranas predate the Bhakti poets. Although... Born, Bhakti born in the Tamil Nadu, then uh, became young in the Karnataka and became older in the Maharashtra, something like So that, that you just said exactly what I uh, just said. That's what I am telling, that that thing is mentioned in the uh, uh, Bhagavad Purana. So that is what we are seeing here. So I mean to say whether it is composed somewhere near the Bhakti times or is it uh, prior to that? So I don't know what verse you're referring to. Could be a later edition. Bhagavata Purana, very important text, particularly in the bhakti sense. It was most likely written in the south, a later Purana that became very popular. All the Krishna devotion that you find, find some kind of source in that Purana. But it is unlike the great, you know, 18 Mahapuranas. Very different than those. It's not as old as those. It was most likely composed in the south, incorporated a lot of these ideas, maybe inspired some of these ideas. So it is in a, a very unique and different category. Yes. Uh, sir, one more point which I would like to add is, uh, Nanadev was in his teenage uh, when he translated entire Gita into Marathi. And at 21, he took Samadhi. So we can see that uh, this sort of awakening usually comes at later ages. But he was in his teenage when he was doing this stuff. Yeah, I mean, like I'm saying, see, a lot of, the, like this Andal was quite young. Many of these people were quite young. It's, it's that adolescent period where even you're going through a lot of changes, right? 
And sometimes in those processes, in those times, you also have some kind of mystical experiences or life-changing experiences or transformative experiences. So possibly it was like that. And, and fundamentally, most of these guys fall under that category of being mystics. They're not like the standard person. They're something different. They're touched by something that inspired them to sing these songs or write these poems or whatever. There's something about these guys. Yes? So I'm glad. See, I want to learn from you. Uh, I want to add that uh, Nandev is also saying that uh, God is uh, like Nirakar, doesn't have shape or anything. But still, I can see him. So this is something like Nirakar and Akar thing means. Both. Yeah, so this is like that Sagwana Nirguna yeah, thing. Sagwana At Nirguna one level, thing, yeah. he says you're formless. And one minute, he's saying standing on the brick. And he has to go to a temple. So even when you kind of are protesting, Thing. There's some implicit acceptance of that thing at some level too. And we're kind of moving more. When you get into some of the later stuff, it's totally devoid of that. There's no temple, no god even anymore. It's more pure philosophy, you could say. So it's all an evolution. And you have to be able to pull out these different strands during that whole process. So that's a good point. At one level, he's saying all of this stuff has no form, right? And at the end, he's talking about a form. Is that a contradiction? Or does it represent steps in this process of an evolution of bhakti? I don't know. I think it represents those steps. And I would argue that I don't even find a contradiction in it. I see it more like that double helix, that these two strands are coming together. And certainly, the poets themselves, I don't think, found any contradiction in it. Maybe this will be a good time to, well, let's get to this one. Now, one, one issue of bhakti that people have talked about is that everydayness, that inclusiveness. Can everyone participate in this act of worship of God? Is everyone allowed into the temple? Is everyone allowed to sing these songs? Is everyone allowed to hear the Vedas? There is most definitely a social revolution component of bhakti. Whether it is felt everywhere, in all the poems, I don't know, probably not. But certainly there is that component. And you know, this poem almost reads like something you might hear, uh, you know, a modern day Dalit writer writing. And this is the 14th century. Why have you thrown this challenge God? Again, addressing God, but in a very different way than like, let us say, Namalvar, who says, you're amazing, you're wonderful, you're everything. He's saying, why have you thrown this challenge, God? Solve this riddle of mine. Enter my shoes. Know in your own self, an outcast, what rights do I enjoy? Says Choka, this low-born human body, everyone drives away. Doubts prey on my mind. What can I do? I mean, it's powerful stuff. Very directly asking God, why did you do this? And why don't you come down here and find out what it's really like? When we address God in Hindi, do we say Aap? No, what do we say? Because you're close to God. He's not, or she, or it, or whatever, is not something distant and far away. All of these guys have that voice that they're addressing almost like a human being in front of them. But he has some serious concerns. And he's putting a challenge to God. But in essence, it's his own frustration about this social situation that he finds himself in. And the pain of it. Very intense stuff. Kabir. Now here, Kabir is an interesting case because you get some Saguna stuff coming up, but the Nirguna stuff is the really powerful stuff. And again, here is an example of very non-normative kind of talk. 
it's heavy confusion. Veda, Quran, holiness, hell, women, man, a clay pot shot with sperm. When the pot falls apart, what do you call it? Namskal, you've missed the point. It's all one skin and bone, one piss and shit, one blood, one meat. From one drop of universe, who's Brahman, who's Shudra? Brahman, Raja, Shiva, Tamas, Vishnu, Sattva, Kabir, sorry, Brahman, Raja, Shiva, Tamas, Vishnu, Sattva, Kabir says, plunge into Ram. There, no Hindu, no Turk. Now he's trying to shock us. You don't want to hear words like all this piss and shit and all this stuff. It is meant to shake you up. It is meant, like they said, I didn't, unfortunately I had a DSC, I couldn't go to the uh, uh, Sambhaji's songs. But he was saying, I read in the paper, you know, we're meant, we're not here to like perform for you and sing songs. We're here to disturb you. We're here to shake you. That's what these guys are doing. They're shaking you. They're making you question things. And yet, even in this kind of Nirgura thing, finally he says, Ram. So in the end, everyone still has their own kind of personal God that things get attached to. It's hard to leave that. And as you all well know, I mean, the, the, being in Banaras, Hindu Muslim issues were, you know, persistent even then. And he really wants to remove this thing. He's very concerned about that. And I'm sure you guys, and this is, of course, not in that typical Dohe form that many of you might have learned some Kabir Dohe. This is, this is quite powerful and quite uh, instigatory. He wants to kind of, you know, poke you. And I hope you're feeling that poke. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, uh, you just said that the Bhakti movement talks about the Nirguna, Brahm, uh, Nirguna um, God or the Brahma, uh, whereas uh, prior, uh, before this it was the Saguna that was going on. So what would you say about Adi Shankaracharya, uh, Advaita Vedanta, where he, that's the Nirguna uh, Brahma, and in fact the Bhakti where you have the personalized God, uh, we are dealing with the uh, Saguna. Um, so is it a mixture or is it a transition that is going on or uh, means... Uh, Excellent question and you've just, you know, kind of introduced the next thing. We can pause this part and, and go to that. In fact, I wanted to start with this but I got off on a tangent. What you're asking is like what I was trying to get at at the beginning. That these two things, right, you could put those on some kind of dialectic, Nirguna Saguna, but really, it's like this. It's all mixed up inside. And it's very difficult to pull apart those strands all the time, even though our intellectualizing mind wants to do that. And in fact, that is what bhakti is about, is destroying that dialectic intellectualizing mind. You have to start to feel things. You have to feel things intuitively. So I will come back to Shankaracharya in just one second, because in many ways, or we can go through it now, Shankaracharya, represents to me, as he has come down in the tradition, as this. Even though it is my contention, and you know, a lot of scholarly work has gone into this, Shankara is actually more this. Shankara is a great philosopher. He wrote you know, commentaries on the Gita and Upanishads and the Brahma Sutras. This was the work. Today we think of him as the great reviver of Hinduism, you know, all this bhakti stuff. But it seems that many of these hymns, not his scholarly works, but the hymns, are not actually uh, Shankara's own stuff, but the kind of tradition that followed after him. But we attribute those things to him, so he becomes this kind of iconic figure who brings together the, both of these things. So I'll give you an example. I mean, I, I remember growing up with this every, every not 
well, Saturday was kind of like our puja day, so every day, Saturday I would hear this. And I, hopefully some of you have heard this. This is Raja Ji talking about Bhaja Govindam. Very famous hymn, I hope you've heard this. Do you know the, one of the stories about how this hymn came about? These are also stories that get told. Anyone want to tell it? Want to tell? Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's have the mic. When, uh, when Shankaracharya was roaming in the streets of uh, Banaras for the arms, he, he found one old man uh, doing the Sanskrit panini part of some dhatu that, uh, I forgot that. Dushkrun, it's a funny word, it's a Pananian thing, yeah. Uh, uh, Dukru or something. So, uh, so there he, he thought he's so old that now it is no, uh, there is no sign, if, even if he learns all the uh, means, uh, grammar and all those things, then even though he learns all these things, what is the use of that in his uh, uh, next life or say after death or something like that? Right. So How is this I, really going to help you prepare for the inevitability of your own death. How is all of this intellect? You know, we're in this big institute, we know all this stuff. What does that do for you when, you know, there's a death in the family or some other tragedy or the difficulties that one faces in life? Who do you turn to then? That's when people turn to God because they're lost, they're confused, they don't understand. But this to me represents, that story in and of itself represents, I think, the tradition's way of taking that heavily intellectual Shankara, who was a master at Vyakarana, I don't think uh, uh, such a great, you know, Maha Upadhyaya would, you know, criticize someone for teaching Panini. But the tradition of the story uh, uh, has become like that, that he had an issue with that, and he said, don't overthink things, don't get too attached to your jnana, get into this bhakti thing because that's what will save you. That's how the story goes. Let's hear what Rajaji says about this, because it's quite profound. And I, I mean, I used to remember this every day. Jnana and bhakti are one. And that is exactly what I'm trying to say here. Let us hear, because it's quite beautiful. Two minutes, how profound, clear his understanding of the situation was. Adi Shankaracharya wrote a number of Vedantic works for imparting knowledge of the Self and the Universal Spirit. He also composed a number of hymns to foster bhakti in the hearts of men. One of these hymns is the famous Bhaja Govinda. The way of devotion is not different from the way of knowledge or jnana. When the intelligence matures and lodges securely in the mind, it becomes wisdom. When wisdom is integrated with life and issues out in action, it becomes bhakti. Right. Knowledge, when it becomes fully mature, is bhakti. If it does not get transformed into bhakti, such knowledge is useless tinsel. To believe that jnana and bhakti, knowledge and devotion are different from each other is ignorance. Avidya. If Sri Adi Shankara himself, who drank the ocean of jnana as easily as one sips water from the palm of one's hand, sang in his later years hymns to develop devotion. It is enough to show that jnana and bhakti are one and the same. Sri Shankara has packed into the Bhaja Govindam song the substance of all Vedanta and set the oneness of jnana and bhakti to melodious music. So you can't have that without now listening to MS Subalakshmi. Because singing the songs, the performance is critical to all of the tradition. It's such 
just the first verse, let's hear it. <laughs> Baja, same root, right? We saw. Worship Govinda, you fool. When you finally get that moment of your death, this see, saying all these dukruns will never save you, man. Okay, so that was the first verse. And also basically summarized that small story that you told, exactly. I cannot stress how important music is to this whole thing of bhakti. And, I mean, you, you guys have heard about the rasas. You know, at one point, uh, Abhinava Gupta and that Kashmiri school, they developed the idea that beyond these rasas, there's another big rasa that takes care of all of them. That was Shanta Rasa. Who said that? Got it right. Later on, bhakti is also considered a ras. And not an individual one, but a totalizing one, the way that Shanta is. That whatever the rag is, whatever the rasa of that thing is, that you must do it with devotion. That bhakti will take over no matter what the actual, you know, particular ras or rag is. Right? So it becomes very, very critical. And the expression of all these poems, these poems just don't exist as poems. People sing them, people perform them in the temples, outside of temples, whatever. And music, I mean, you know I love music, but you can feel it, man. I mean, sometimes I listen to this and I just get, I look, at it, I'm getting it already. You just hear, I mean, and MS, it's like, it's like she's like the voice of bhakti, man. I mean, you put this on in the morning every day. I mean, when I used to walk, you know, my grand, parents' house, you know, I'd be, you hear one verse here, you walk down a little bit more, and somebody else is playing the same, and you hear the next verse. I mean, if you start your day like this, I guarantee things will be nice. Just try it. All right, let's go back, finish these up real fast, and then we'll get to some more songs, because that's, that's part of it. Here, I just leave this here like this. Annamaya. Wonderful, wonderful poet. And again, we're going to find, this is a Telugu poet, lived near Tirupati, became a great devotee of Venkateshwara. And his massive corpus of, of compositions were divided by, I think, his grandson, or one of his descendants, into two categories. Anyone know what those two categories were? Or are. I'm hearing it. Who said it? Who's saying it? Somebody got it? No? There was Shringara and Adhyatmika. So again, you find another one of these bifurcations. You have the spiritual stuff on one side, and you have this kind of erotic stuff on the other side. But really, this whole divine, profane, sacred, non-sacred, you know, mundane, divine. All of this, all of these divisions are mixed up. And I mean, this one, I mean, just read, you know, all this love poetry gets into this bhakti too. Now, hear how he talks about uh, God, at least in this context. These marks of black musk on her lips, red as buds, what are they but letters of love sent by our friends to her lover? Her eyes, the eyes of a chakora bird, why are they red in the corners? And this is beautiful. So he poses this question. Right? Why are they red? Think it over, my friends. What is it but the blood 
still staining the long glances that pierced her beloved after she drew them from his body back to her eyes. I mean, kya baate? If you don't feel that, then just wait a second. Because it's going to come to life in a whole new way. This is that same Annamaya uh, Kirti. Kasturi Ninde Mamini Vibune Kura Sine Patrika Duke Chiguru Te Mune Yeda Neda Kasturi Ninde She's just repeating that first uh, all living kind of thing. Listen to Sudaranganathan. All right, let's go back to this. Mira, beloved in the north. Again, like an Andal type character, young girl, totally in love with God. But here you're going to get a little bit of a different feeling. So I'll read this one out. Yogin, don't go. At your feet a slave girl has fallen. She lost herself on the devious path of romance and worship. No one to guide her. Now she's built an incense and sandalwood pyre and begs you to light it. Dark one, don't go. When only cinder remains, rub my ash over your body. Mira asks, dark one, can flame twist upon flame? Very intense. The kind of just, you're willing to give your life for this. That's really what it all comes down to. That this is more than your own human life, this passion that you have or this love that you have. And that's why a lot of these love metaphors from the older love poetry find their way into the whole tradition of bhakti literature, albeit in, in a, a different context altogether. And always notice that at the end of these poems, you always get Basava's name, Mira's name, Choka's name. It is that individuality that I kind of made my initial claim about that subjectivity coming in, that individual voice. Rooted in something very real and tangible and you know, present. Any questions? I know this is kind of a lot of stuff to look at, but there's no other way to talk about such a huge concept than to try to give you guys all a taste of it from different places. 
Here's another one, Bengal, for now from the east. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, oh, you did mention an, another. We had uh, Andal, we had Mahadevi Akka, we had. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. She, she's a long line of female poets. No, Meera is probably more uh, known in the Western yes. uh, region. That's why I was kind of confused. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there are others in the north, too. So here's one from the east. Again, a very direct attack on normative behavior. Now, the Bengal stuff comes also, you know, you remember I was saying all these different strands, right? So you have the Vedic, Upanishadic, Puranic, all of these strands. Another big strand is the Shakta, Tantric, Vajrayana Buddhism, all of that you find in eastern part in Bengal, all of that gets put in here. You know, I didn't give you an example of Baal singers. You listen to Baal songs, that falls into the bhakti modality. But here's a poem. I throw ashes at all laws made by man or God. Now God's even out of the picture. I am born alone with no companion. What is the worth of our vile laws that failed me in love and left me with a fool, a dumb skull? My wretched fate is so designed that he is absent for whom I long. I will set fire to this house and go away. Very intense. They don't want laws. They don't want rules. They want to transcend all of this stuff. That's what is the reoccurring theme, basically, is transcendence. To get beyond these conventional normative practices, that there is something beyond that. Now, Sufi you said, which I appreciated, because that is the other big strand that comes in at a little bit later point and, and gets mixed in. And you know we need a whole other talk to d discuss Sufi and all of that stuff. But you find a very similar, especially the Sringara Ras, happening in many of these poems too. This particular Bulle Shah one is a little bit more on the philosophical side. But the interesting difference is generally the Hindu stuff comes, you know, you'll have uh, basically the female voice dominates those traditions. Whereas in the Sufi stuff, it's the other way around. You're actually talking to a woman with beautiful curls and this thing and that thing. Whereas in the other side, it's mostly to male gods, even if a woman is singing or a man is singing. Okay. What has happened to me? The I in me is lost and gone. What has happened to me? Why do they call me crazy? When I look into myself, there is no I. Selfless, whoever said that, very nice. Only you can be seen in me. From head to foot, there is only you. You are inside and outside. I am free from the far bank and the near bank. There is no boat. There is no river. Now, some of this, you know, kind of dialectic language, contradictory language, it seems out of place. We don't know how to react to it, what to do with it. We're not sure what it means. But that's really what the bhakti ex experience is about. And if you get to that place, if you get to that state of ecstasy, that kind of place where you get to maybe when you listen to great music, or even that place that you get to if you're deeply absorbed in some sport. You're not thinking then, right? You're just there in the moment doing. It's, that's what this whole experience is about. And this is a, another tradition. Bulisha is a great source for many Sufi songs. So here's Abdullah Parveen. I love, this isn't that poem, but another one. Follow it. There's a translation. 
बराबर इश्क ते आतिश नू ही बराबर होवत इश्क दताओ तिखेरा And this is Gulab Afrid coming in too. She mixes two things. आतिश सारे कख ते कनेरा अते इश्क सारे दिल जेरा होला आतिश So that is a whole other topic, uh, which requires more time and exploration. Um, so there's a question. Yes. Sir, can you please elaborate on uh, the point where you mentioned that Sufism has a more uh, like dominated male voice? So I mean, can you give a, give some examples of that? Because what what I have seen is it, it's gender neutral. That's how I see Sufism. I mean, you, it, there is no such gendered element. It's just talking to the individual, the inside. So, um, can you? So, so at, 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 at a higher level, I agree with you. But if you look at most Sufi poetry, it describes the woman's form, like the locks of hair and the eyes and the nazaro and all this stuff. It's basically a description of fundamentally rooted in a male love of a, of a female as the, the person who's receiving the love. In many of the Hindu cases, it's regardless of voice, it's a male god that's being described. Yeah, I agree with, about the Hindu uh, thing, yeah. but about the bhakti thing, but not exactly about the Sufi thing. So can you give some examples of that so that it's like clear? I, I don't have many examples sitting on me right now, but I mean, if someone has a bunch of poetry that we could look at any of these guys, you will clearly see that. I mean, I can try to look at one of these collections if we can find some Sufi poets, and you can, or you listen to Sufi songs, man. Forget about. I mean, I could pick any song right now. You want to pick one? Let's find out. Yeah, let's do it. So let's go to YouTube. Let's say Nusrat. One of my favorites. Yeah. Maskalander. Mas okay. This is a little bit not no, about that romantic side. Very famous Kavali, must must. This is more just about must must. 
for Lal Shabazz Kalandar, right? So he is also a guy. I mean, a male. Let me let me find one that shows a good example of that. Um, I'm just saying that it's it's not a gender. He's not talking about a guy's glance. He needs saving from this guy's this girl's eyes. Not a guy's eyes. Not a good quality. I'll find, I'll find a better quality. I mean, this is this this one, for example, is a. Here we go. This one, for example, is a Amir Husro written one. So let's see what he's saying. Sorry. Mischievous sweetheart. At least that's how he translated it. So my only point was the object of devotion, generally in the Sufi context, is a woman. Whereas in the other context, in the Hindu stuff, you mostly get the male as an object. And I think this has to do with the traditions. I mean, Sufi stuff is drawing more on a older Persian tradition, and the Hindu stuff you could say is drawing more on an older Sanskritic tradition. So I'm not a master of Sufi poetry or any of this poetry, to be honest. So that, from what I have studied and understood, I would say that's a general categorical distinction we could possibly make. At the same time, the real point to be understood is no matter who you're talking to, male or woman, they really don't care. It's not, that's not even the point. It, Maybe that was the way, the, the direction of your affections or whatever, but the essence of the, the meaning is kind of the same. That I'm stuck in this horrible relationship, you're not coming to me, I need you, whatever it may be, right? Fill me up, save me, all of this rhetoric is the same. So it's a good question. What else? 
Yes. Oh my God. Yeah, I just showed you, na. Abida Parveen. But I think that's a very uh, so. She's just one example as yeah. far as I have so seen. So there aren't many. You're yeah. absolutely so right. So maybe because of that, we have in Sufi and we have more uh, songs towards females as well as, as as compared to in Hindu where the singer herself is a woman. That's why the songs are towards male. But then there's plenty of male singers who sing to the male gods too. I mean, Namalvar, the one that we started with. So what I'm saying is, whoever's doing the singing, male or female, or whoever's doing the poetry, it's the object that's the thing that changes in these two traditions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't find that many Hindu bhakti poems to the goddess. There are some, but you, not a lot. The majority is not. Mostly it's Shivas and Vishnus and these guys that get uh, described and worshipped. Um, this is not a question on music. It's um, you mentioned briefly the Bengal part, right? What's that? The Bengal part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. So I'm not an expert on this, but um, although we are talking about certain kind of resistance in Bengal, um, Vakti movement actually helped, you know, the reinforcement of certain Brahminical values, like vegetarianism, for example. Um, and you know, it's um, sort of instead of questioning or challenging the existing social relations, it actually sort of tried to mediate certain, you know, um, problems. True. Within, um, that could be between true. Between the upper and the lower caste. So yeah, so I, I'm not, again, an expert yeah. either. And that could be possible. That's kind of what I'm saying is that bhakti doesn't always have to be revolutionary or against the norms, but many times it is. I don't know about this vegetarian uh, thing, but Vegetarianism, anti-alcoholism, um, so uh, whatever traditions, popular traditions from the margins, or uh, non-vegetarianism is very common in Bengal, so it's not even a marginal. Right, uh, that's... Thing. But this particular, I mean, ethos, actually, I mean, bhakti ethos, it, it hinted at the reinforcement of uh, upper caste values. Yeah, I mean, e even if, when we look at the earlier stuff, I think this is a, a good point, and if I didn't make it clear enough, I, I, at one level, any form of resistance is a type of kind of acceptance of that normative system or any, any commentary on that thing, right? I mean, like for, I mean, I tell this in class, like Gandhi in South Africa, he's not looking for independence. He just wants to be a British citizen. So like the early Bhakti guys, maybe they're not totally revising the system, but they're commenting on some part that they want to be a part of. Then later on, you get a lot more kind of, more of that, you know, intense, powerful antagonism towards some social structures. So I don't know exactly the case of Bengal, but what I really want to say is there's no way to really sum it all up and say that it is this or it is not that. In some ways that could have functioned, some poets could have functioned in that way, further reifying certain things. In other cases, they could have been defined. I mean, like I'm saying, the Baal singers, I mean, they're really out. They're, they're, not, they're not, you know, supporting any kind of normative behavior, right? Is that what you're getting at, or is, did I miss something? Sorry? I was, just, I was just trying to, you know, kind of Complicate problematize any sort of generalization. Yeah, uh, I, I, that's, that, that's what I started this whole talk with, is that there's no way you can really say it's one thing or not. It's all of these things, and yet my point the thing that I really wanted to stress, what I found across the board, no matter what was going on, is that voice. Is that this is an individual speaking their mind or their heart. That was important. Yeah, yeah, Krupa had the question. Um, you told us earlier that uh, music was a very important part of the bhakti poetry. I was just wondering about the structure of that composition and uh, even the video which you showed us that uh, Sudha Raghunathan sang, uh, how does, did that fit in into the raga uh, system or how, how was the music uh, composed and how did it come through to us like through the years? Did, did that change in the way that, I mean the words would probably have remained the same. So I was just thinking about, a little bit about the music itself. Music uh, has changed too. In some cases we have, for example, if you look at Gita Govinda, right, also a later text, Again, written in Sanskrit, so you're like back to Sanskrit now. 
It's like okay. bhakti, like yeah. infused into the. There, the rags are mentioned, yeah. but they're not the same rags we often find them performed today. Yeah, that's Sometimes we don't even know what those old rags are. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Anamaya stuff and many of the other compositions. Sometimes there's a rag mentioned, sometimes there's not. And most of the times it's not sung exactly yeah. how it was written in the text. So these things have evolved. There's been no fixity. There's a variety of traditions. It's very difficult to say. The music stuff is constantly evolving. People are resetting old poems to new rags all the time. So that happens. So it's, yeah. music is totally there. What it was um, in terms of specificity about rag and that kind of stuff changes. And it's still changing even, even okay. today. Uh, I had another small point to ask you. Yeah. Uh, in the slides which you showed, yeah. the different poets from different regions, yeah. there was also this uh, small caption down, line down about the languages in which yeah. uh, they sang. So with Meera, it said Hindi. And Meera has actually been also talked about in the context of Gujarati, Rajasthani, and all of these. Uh, so I'm just wondering if we can problematize the way that we even talk about a certain, I mean, language as a fixed kind of a thing when we're talking about uh, bhakti poets which, which are singing in that particular kind of a, a mixed idiom or language. I, di I didn't get the question. Um, I'll just add to her question. She was asking, uh, you mentioned Meera as a Hindi poet, like she's writing in Hindi, whether uh, a fixity of category like Hindi or a language to a bhakti poet who was so, like, I, I, I'm, I'm not getting what you're saying clearly. Okay. So, uh, Mira was that was written Hindi there. What's the next thing? Yeah. So, uh, w when you fix a category like uh, a, a particular language like Hindi to her, which was uh, before the evolution of a fixed language like Hindi, wasn't that slightly problematic? I, 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 I really am not able to hear clearly what you're asking. No, I think what we're just trying to say is that the ascri ascription of a language to a particular poet, the notion of that language having evolved into something concrete as we know it today, yeah. will probably be retrospective. I mean, yeah, it is. I so mean, whether or not we call that exactly Hindi. Yeah, exactly. I mean, of course, but that's the best I can do right now. <laughs> I mean, what do you want? You, you can go read scholarship on Mira and find out if they want to call it Rajasthani or Braj or some mixture of that. And yes, of course, that's there. But what's the question, though? No, I was just. I that I should have complicated that more. I wanted to more. know the complexity of that language. Exactly how. I mean, all languages are complex. It, that's all. They're they're all at like that. At that particular that. historical moment. That's what Sorry. I said. To understand it at that particular historical moment. That's all. I mean. Yeah. So. So you're just talking about la language evolution. Is that is that what you're asking? Okay. Because I mean, you know, I mean, that's one of my big subjects. I'll talk about that all day long. Yeah, so, yeah, it's hard to say if it's Hindi or not, but it's certainly not Tamil, let's put it that way. Yes, sir. So, let me respond very quickly. So, what both of them, what both of you have just said about, well, it isn't Hindi, it isn't, uh, this language that we call Hindi uh, hasn't evolved until then, un uh, until this time. Well, I would say that it's splitting hairs, as Srini is saying. Why is that? Shakespeare is not English, is it? And yet the English claim it to be English. Moliere is not French. We've got a Frenchman here, or former Frenchman, right? And language evolves, and the boundaries are blurred, but you have to give it some name. And if you get hung up on name, you, I mean, you get lost in detail. So yes, of course, in the bhakti movement to respond to the lady who talked about Bengal. You have Tulsi Das, and if I remember the verse correctly, I forget, there is something like Dhor Gamar Pashu Arunari, Sakal Talan Ke Adhikari. I don't know if you remember this, which is like Dhor uh, Gamar Pashu Arunari, meaning Dhor, meaning a particular lower caste, Gamar, someone illiterate, Pashu meaning animal, and Nari obviously meaning women. These all deserve sound beatings. Now, if you go back to um, Old English, th there is a phrase like you need a thick pair of boots to kick women with and a thick pair of lips to kiss them with. This is in English too. So every language has a mixed legacy. Every era has a mixed legacy. And Bhakti, you could argue, has Tulsi, who's also challenging the status quo in some way. I mean, I because, be because you could say, well, he's... He's pushing it towards the vernacular, 
and it's got Kabir at the other end of the spectrum, who's the real rebel. So every independence movement, and he pointed out Gandhi, every independence movement or every reform movement or every radical movement, the French Revolution had a whole host of characters, from Robespierre to, to who was that fellow? Uh, um, uh, Lafayette. So there were people who sort of were guarding the king and wanted a constitutional monarchy, and there were people who wanted heads to rule. So that's just the nature of movement, but yet all of knowledge is a generalization of the human experience. And so you have to come to certain precepts and make certain uh, you know, remarks and inferences, and that's what Srini is doing. Yeah, and if I just, I mean, I know Krupa is asking this because she's a literature student, too, and, I, and we're all, I mean, you know, we're literary guys, we're interested in this kind of stuff, and we can talk about it. But this was a very simple, but the main thing is, it's in a language that a very general group of people could understand. That is really the key point, is that it was in a language that most people could follow, could understand, could comprehend, and feel. That is the critical part of the bhakti thing. That it was not a very inaccessible form of language, or form, or genre, or whatever. That it was quite easily digestible by many people. And song made it even more so, you could argue. Yes, Vasu. Uh, so I was wondering if you could uh, trace a connection between uh, the Bhakti movement and the entire uh, um, start of the Carnatic legacy. So the connection between Tyagaraja, for example, because uh, Bhakti somehow fits as a, as a, as a corollary to what she was asking, Krupa was asking about the rendition in music. So it somehow seems to fit so naturally into the very structure of Carnatic music. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could trace the connection from, I mean, Annamaya was on one side, but Tyagaraja was uh, down south. So if the, in terms of the structure, the formation of the structure, and with the, um, the essence being imbued into the structure of Carnatic uh, renditions, if there is a connection, or, or, or the Carnatic tradition has only adopted it from Bhakti movement, or is it like a transition from that phase? Mm -hmm. Huge topic to think about, I'm not sure. They're obviously interconnected. I mean, you know, it wasn't also until a little bit later that Anamaya became generally accepted, let's say, on a classical stage. Maybe people would be singing these kirtanas in the, in the temple or in another space, but the classical music that we know today as Carnatic music was probably absorbed a lot of that stuff that was happening organically at a more, you know, grassroots level. That's my idea. As opposed to, I'm talking about like Anamaya. If you talk about someone like Tyagaraja, he's a little bit, I mean, not, he's much later. So Bhakti had already kind of perfumed the whole land quite powerfully, and that was just the kind of religiosity that he was steeped in. And so it naturally came out that way, and then, you know, he became a major composer. Where you can't have a concert these days without a Tyagaraja or something. I Probably, at least from a classical music perspective, a lot of this stuff came in later than it was actually created and performed outside of that classical space, and they were maybe brought into the classical fold as time went on. I don't know if that answered your question, but it's a tricky question too. Tracking bhakti and Carnatic music. Yes. Yes. Uh, it seems to me that all you know, the songs that we heard, they're all protests, basically. It seems that the Bhakti movement is about protest. So what was the backdrop that you know, led to you know, this bubbling up of protest, you know, whether political or social? Did any, I mean, what is the tipping point that led to this? I don't, see, that's the thing. I don't think there was a tipping point. It, 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 you talk about something that's huge and pervasive and discursive as bhakti. It happens in small pockets here and there, grows over time. And, and as I was saying, not all of them have that protest quality. Maybe some of them, I mean, like the, you heard the one about, that's the Anamaya one, heavy on the Sringara. There wasn't so much protest, at least social protest in that. Yeah. So 
it's very difficult to say, except that a social component was clearly always part of any of these things. Whether or not it was explicit in terms of protest or reform, I think you see that in the later stuff more and more, and mm -hmm. not so much in the earlier yeah, yeah, stuff. So there's an evolution there also. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would say. I, and if you look through the poems again, not all of them have that protest thing, which is why revolution is good, but it, it can't characterize the whole thing, which is why from the beginning of the talk, I've been trying to think of if, if we can't characterize it with one of these things totally, then what is it? Is it even fair to call all of this stuff, stuff bhakti? And the only thing that I could come up with at the end is that singular voice issue. So whether or not they're protesting or not was not the issue, but the fact that they were expressing whatever was inside of them in a direct way, that was the critical part to me. Yeah, but the taking on convention, right? Yeah. So, you know, you know, something, I'm just wondering whether there was something in the landscape, political landscape or whatever, that actually led to, you know, so many people, even when you talk about Shringar, that was also the, not the norm, right? That was so, also? Not the norm. So, you know, it was. It was the norm. Yeah, yeah, it was. Okay. Because that comes straight out of the old poetry. All of that Shringarara stuff. Yeah, no, but to use it with devotion. Yeah. You know, to use it with that. So it's a different way of doing it. It is. So he's, that is also a way of saying, okay, I'm not going to even address devotion in the same typical way. Yeah. I'm going to do it through Shringar. Right. You know? So, right. you know, at every level, there is a form of, you know, let's take on the system. So I'm just wondering that, you know, there has to be something happening in society. I'm just wondering. That would have led to people, you know, thinking that way and, you know, mm -hmm. it coming forth, you know. Tough to say. For, for dealing with 800 years or something of, of history in multiple places in the country, very difficult to say. What were the, are you kind of asking political or other forces that may have played into this? I'm pressed to figure out if there's any one singular answer for that. Okay. And you know, we have to try to not even look for those things is what I'm saying. Is that it's too complicated to really pin it down like that. Because something might have happened here that didn't happen there that you know, prompted this or that. But if, if we wanted to make some generalization, like you're, you're kind of asking, possibly. It was the breakdown of certain, you know, larger political formations with more local regional governance forms. Mm -hmm. I would say if you looked at large part of the medieval period and what happens, and when this starts stuff, stuff starts percolating, it's that. Mm -hmm. right? So you don't have one superstructure state formation that's saying this is the language of the land, this is the language of documents, whatever. Now you have smaller regional areas where people are getting into now we don't have to use a Prakrit or a Sanskrit. We can use Kannada to write our okay. inscriptions. Mm -hmm. So that brings in that vernacular component, which is, again, another critical aspect of, you know, this became a potential to express yourself, whereas before it was not. Yeah. So the language is critical. Language being influenced by regional polities, I think, is also important. But again, I wouldn't venture any one certain clear thing to you know, characterize this hugely diverse and, you know, complex thing. But it's a good question, and I think what we really need to do is start doing very focused case studies. Hmm. You know, you take one poet, you take one region and find out what happened there. You go and do the same kind of analysis in another period in another state or another region. And then we can start building up some kind of theories, as you're saying, but you know, we still need to do that kind of research. And if you guys are thinking about this, you should Definitely do that. You know, I think that's a very good thing to do. Yes. Thank you. Ashdeep. Sir, can we say that the caste system played a role in uh, a bhakti moment? Because caste system was prevailed all over India, and uh, there was a certain amount of injustice going on in that uh, in that society. So some people still going on. So, uh, so uh, a bhakti. Uh, May, uh, made that happen, so. Bhakti is one modality in which the confines of the caste system and the injustices of that system were definitely addressed 
and maybe some changes came out of it, certainly they were being talked about. I mean, you saw the Choka uh, poem, so that was very clear. And there's lots of other examples like that. So yes, caste was uh, one of those critically normative, you know, social structures that was a point of discussion for many of the bhakti poets, although I would not say that all of them fell into that category of social criticism. But yes, it's a, it's a major theme, and it grows more as you go later on in history. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you. Yeah, OK, Ambarish. Uh, so how do we fit in the role of uh, the Sikh religion in Yeah, the, you know, I, ha I had one from Guru Nanak, but I couldn't find a good translation that I liked. But Nanak is a perfect example of drawing on both traditions. I mean, you find Kabir Dohe inside Guru Granth Sahib. So he was really like a synthesizer of many things. And to a certain extent, this removal of this, uh, of an idol, of this kind of direct kind of worship that became a little bit more transcendental in its nature, you know, that there's something beyond this. And you might say philosophical or non-denominational in its nature. That all comes out in, in the Sikh hymns also, yes. Yes, and uh, Sikh religion wa was the only uh, bhakti movement which eventually crystallized into a separate religion and a, po a polity as well. So yeah. is there any similarity between uh, the Maratha bhakti, uh, the Maharashtrian bhakti traditions and the Sikhs? The reason I ask this question is because they were, both of these uh, went on to become empires in their own right. So, uh, like, will it be a apples to oranges comparison, or uh, do we see some similarities in both of them? Well, you 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 don't have you don't have a new religion forming, right? In the in case of the Marathas, yes. right? You don't have that. So there's a difference right off the bat, like you said. Now, whether or not, again, linking it to the development of, you know, regional powers. Possibly, maybe this is, gave some core of defining those guys in a very regional sense with an identity, a language, and a poetry related to that. It also had you know, the quality of resistance to it and individuality, so perhaps, but I think it's a, 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 a quite a big stretch. And you, know, you need to write a whole thesis about this. Yes, sir. I, I would uh, like to, uh, like, uh, try to answer that question in, okay. in my limited understanding of uh, uh, no, You're a good boss. You, you told the Shankara story. Go for it. So, uh, limited uh, understanding of history and bhakti poetry. So, if you'll see, I'll say uh, when Sikh empire came into existence in, on the some religious or uh, uh, like that basis, as, at that time I'll say uh, the Sikh as a religion has been formed. Whereas you will see, if you will see Maratha, uh, means Ma Maratha Empire, that came into existence after the uh, death of, or say, I will say, decline of bhakti tradition in the Maharashtra. I will say, last Maharashtra poets are, um, bhakti poets are uh, Tukaram or uh, Samartha Ramdas, who died just during the time of Shivaji. Then after Maratha Empire actually rises, and actually it rises with Brahminical power, if you will say because the Senapati is Peshwas, who are actually Brahmins. And there we call the, uh, instead of Santa, we go, go to uh, uh, Panta, Panta Sahitya, that is uh, uh, yeah. Moro Panta or uh, something. Those are again Brahminical, so they are again bringing that into Marathi. So, so maybe that could be. So if I could just comment on that and again address this. OK, go ahead. Perfect. I love it when you guys talk more than me, man. Sir, actually, uh, what happened in Maharashtra, uh, uh, it was a little bit of uh, like resistance to Muslims. Uh, S sorry, say again? Uh, it was a little bit like uh, what, what resistance was? to... What was? What was? Start from the beginning again. Uh, means Muslim administration, all those things, means Adil Shah, Nidam Shah, etc. Okay. So, uh, actually, uh, the Bhakti movement in Maharashtra uh, is like foundation of, means, has... Uh, uh, is like founded, uh, is one of the reasons behind the movements against the all those things means uh, it actually uh, motivated people in Maharashtra. 
to uh, unite against all these things. Yeah, so I mean, Samartha Amdasa did the, the, those things. So means, uh, I don't know what the Islam Sultanate and all that stuff yes. has to do with it, because yes. I don't see a connection there. But, but what I'm saying is, all of this regional literature that started for sure to define some kind of regional identities based on that stuff. Now, there's been some critique about this from various scholars, whether or not we had that regional sense of identity early on. But actually, when you read these poems, or you read other types of regional literature, I do think there was a sense of being you know, a Sikh and feeling part of that community. Maybe more so there, because it was rather defined and a clear structure in place. Even in Marathi, even in other parts of India, I think these poems and these movements definitely did create a larger sense of a collective identity based on region and language. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, I also want to ask uh, uh, time of bhakti moment. Huh? Uh, about time of bhakti moment. Uh, means uh, we say that uh, bhakti moment has started from some 7th or 8th century. But uh, why we, st uh, uh, why we, uh, means why we say that it ended in uh, some 1800 means I, i'm really not able to understand what you're saying uh, why we say that uh, bhakti moment ended uh, during the 1800 century I, I, I never said it ended then uh, i think it's still going, it on. still going on okay yeah bhakti is still the main i would say modality of hindu worship today i don't see uh, uh, any change in that really I mean, it's these Annamaya songs, these things that you hear every day. You hear Andal recited in all the temples during Margali Masa in Tamil Nadu. So it's still there. Yes. Uh, sir, I want to ask that uh, how did jnana converts into bhakti, whereas uh, jnana most of the time makes people dispassionate, uh, generally thought about. So this conversion of jnana into bhakti means how do they explain this? You heard Rajaji. He huh. said it, right? Exactly. Jnana yeah. becomes wisdom inside. But unless that wisdom comes into action, and you bring passion to that wisdom, and you know, make it a living thing in real life. So, so many, many, many saints, uh, they talk about dispassionate, being dispassionate after uh, getting the jnana, so so isn't that contradictory means? Like vairagya you're talking about? Some I really don't know about vairagya in true sense, but dispassionate like uh, means. Uh, what do you mean? Are you talking about the stuff like, you know, you should be very sattvic and you should, you know, uh, calm your uh, passions down and not get excited and that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, means generally that we see means, uh, me, Means there is another uh, thing to it, like, like uh, people getting dis dispassionate after uh, um, they talk about dispassionate after getting the right wisdom. Uh, give so, me an example. I, I, like, I mean, uh, what are you saying? After you get wisdom, you become dispassionate. Is that what you're saying? That's what they generally say. I have no who, idea who, about who that. Who generally says? So it's always like they always get uh, they always come to the bhakti mark. Is it like that? I, now I'm, yeah. You want. In the Gita, for example, you have constantly at the beginning an opposition between knowledge and bhakti and karma. But they are eventually not only reconciled, but they are shown to be one and the same. So they are only different parts, but actually, in essence, they are the same. They are not really different. So even though the Gita speaks of samatha, for example, if that's what you mean, equality. So samatha seems perhaps to contradict Yeah, that's what bhakti. I was saying, like the yogis, the, but you know. But actually, at the same time, Krishna praises bhakti as the supreme path. So, but of course, it's a different discourse. But nevertheless, the, there is an answer that I feel. So the contradiction that you're feeling is, in fact, the most natural thing. And in all of these cases, you'll find that kind of dichotomy coming into play, maybe sometimes hard to rationalize intellectually, but in fact is very natural. Uh, sir, uh, the question which Ambarish asked, I would like to add my point to it. So the connection between Maharashtra and Punjab through Bhakti tradition goes back to the 13th century. 
So in 13th century, uh, Maharashtra had one saint, Saint Nam, Sant Namdev. So Namdev in 13th century he had composed some hymns. He had travelled to Punjab, and him and his hymns were so popular that in 16th century Guru Arjan Dev has included some 50 to 60 hymns in Guru Granth Sahib. Hmm. So this was indirectly what Maharashtra gave to Punjab through Bhakti tradition. Now coming back, uh, now talking of what Punjab gave to Maharashtra. So uh, Samarth Ramdas had travelled, uh, was travelling through entire country. So when he was in Punjab, he met with Guru Hargobind. So he was astonished to see a Guru riding a horse, carrying swords. So he had a discussion with Guru Hargobind. Then uh, later we know that Samarth Ramdas was a Guru of Shivaji, Chhatrapati Shivaji. So Punjab gave a, Punjab gave transformed. Uh, Ramdas to Maharashtra. So this is some uh, one link some to the Bhakti tradition. Good. But don't 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 fall into this uh, trap of thinking about Punjab in the 13th century Quickly, or Maharashtra. Uh, right. This story can't be true because of the timelines. Guru Gobind Singh. If you look at the timelines, okay, Har Gobind, okay, okay, then it may be. Yeah. All right. I think we'll stop here. It's 4 o'clock. Thanks for listening. Thanks for coming. And see you next time.